Amen. We thank God for this opportunity to worship him today in spirit and in truth. Uh, this is a celebration. This is a time of, of joy. God has been good to us. He has protected us from danger, seen and unseen. And so we give God great praise today. Won't you give the Lord another hand clap of praise? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, you know, I, I have a short runway, so I'm going to get excited early <laughs> in this sermon. Amen. 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 Well, the scripture has already been read in your hearing uh, by my first and only lady. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I would like to hang as a title over this passage of Scripture, A Feast for the Faithful. A Feast for the Faithful. In this text today, we find that Jesus is captivated by the radical faith of a centurion. We don't even know his name. All we know is that he's a centurion uh, under the Roman government, and he's over some 80 to 100 soldiers. But I want to zero in on the, 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 the most important thing about this passage, this, this pericope of Scripture highlights the necessity of a Christocentric faith for all of God's people, that Christ is at the very center of our faith. After, after all, it is stated in the Bible that the just shall live by faith. What does it really mean to live by faith? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm convinced that to live by faith is to be governed by the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to take Jesus at his word. And over these past several weeks, we have been focusing as a theme of Psalm 34, 8 that says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and happy are those who take refuge in him. So it is important to remember that one of the key elements of Jesus' table fellowship is hospitality, making room for the lost, for the least of these, making room for those who are marginalized, making room for those that we wouldn't normally invite to our table for fellowship. Jesus invited and shared company and food with those who would not normally have been on the guest list as desirable dinner guests. And every time we see Jesus breaking bread with someone or fellowshipping with someone, it's almost as if Jesus is saying to the Jewish people, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> and so here in this passage of Scripture, we see Jesus doing this once again. There are some lessons we can learn, brothers and sisters, from the faith of this centurion. Look at what it says here in verses 5 through 7. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And Jesus said to him, I will come and cure him. Uh, Capernaum was, was Jesus' base for ministry. It was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And oftentimes you see this word Capernaum, which emphasizes that Jesus is getting ready to do ministry in a concentrated area, and he's embarking on ministry in such a way where he's not just making an impression, but he's making an impact. But here on this day, a centurion comes to Jesus. Now, Luke records this passage as well, and Luke says that the centurion sent 
some servants, some Jewish servants to, uh, to Jesus. Uh, nevertheless, the, the emphasis is on the faith of this centurion. And the first thing I want us to see is that this centurion understood the, the object of a radical faith or great faith, as one translation say it, says it. One writer puts it this way, John Stott said that faith is a reason trust, a trust which reckons thoughtfully, confidently upon the trustworthiness of God. With radical faith comes a radical belief in the Word of God. We must allow the Word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, to undermine uh, brothers and sisters, our complacency, and to overthrow our patterns of thoughtful, of thought and behavior. In other words, the Word of God comes to, to challenge us, to change our way of thinking. So J Jesus is confronted, or the centurion comes to him, and this is really the first basic step of faith is that you got to come to Jesus. Jesus is not going to impose himself on us. So it says the centurion came to him, appealing to him, praying to him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. He, he expresses his concern. Now, one writer has said that this servant could possibly be a son of this centurion. One translation says that he's, that this person is a slave or a servant. But in, in, any, in any terms, it, it basically implies that he was a part of the centurion's family. So much so that he didn't want him to die. So much so that he sent someone or he came to Jesus on his own. That's the first thing I want us to say. We, we, we've got to, Jesus is not going to impose himself on us. We must be willing to come to him. Now keep in mind that this passage also points to the reality is what one writer says that Jesus has authority to break down ethnic barriers. Michael Wilkins says that this is a staggering reversal of ethnic and religious expectations. Already at this early stage of Jesus' ministry, not just any Gentile was healed, but the servant of one of the Jews' military oppressors. This Roman soldier was a military oppressor. He represented the Roman government. But Jesus takes it upon himself and responds to the faith of this Roman centurion to heal his servant. Uh, don't, don't, don't just go over this. Don't breeze over this because it's, it's telling us that Jesus is practicing hospitality. It, it, it's telling us that Jesus is saying, well, I will go to, to your home and heal your servant. Now, as a Jew, Jesus is not supposed to go to the home of a Gentile because Gentiles were considered unclean. So for him to go into the home or even be willing to go into the home of a Gentile, implies that he's breaking ethnic, cultural barriers. Amen, somebody. And this tells us, brothers and sisters, that as one, as I've said in, in The Art of Neighboring, that Jesus was, the class I taught called The Art of Neighboring, it, it talks about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, we see Jesus practicing good neighboring. 
We see him being hospitable. We see him crossing ethnic barriers. We see him breaking away from the religiosity of his day. This, this centurion understood that he must come to Jesus. And we also must make that move, that step forward to come to Jesus Christ. So he understood the object of radical faith is Jesus Christ. Not my bank account, not my possessions. The object of our faith is Jesus. It's as simple as that. You, you got to believe Jesus is who he says he is. We got to believe that Jesus will do what he says he will do. We got to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We got to believe that Jesus is the bread of life. We got to believe that Jesus is the light of the world. We've got to believe Jesus is who he says he is. And that's something is clear in this pericope that the centurion understood that the object of his faith is not his career, not the fact that he's a Roman centurion, but the object of his faith is Jesus Christ. But not only that, we can learn also from this centurion that he applied the, the logic of radical faith logic of radical faith. Look at what he says here in verses 8 and 9. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. He said, for I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another come, and he comes, and to my slave do this, and the slave does it. What, look at what he's saying here. The centurion makes a humble declaration of faith. He understands that radical faith is not based on what we know. It's not based on our occupation, but it's based on what God knows. You see, faith is not based on what we can see, it's based on what God can see. That faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. seen. So it's saying, Lord, I trust what you see, even though I can't see it right now. It doesn't make sense to me, Lord, but I'm, I'm trusting you at your word. And what we see here in the centurion's conviction is, if we're going to move to having great faith, we, we've got to increase not our IQ, but our FQ, our faith quotient. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's not about how much we know, but it's how much we trust in what God knows, that God has been to the future and back, brothers and sisters. That God's ways are higher than our ways and that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so it's important that we incorporate the mind, the ways of God into our lives so that we can see what he sees. And that eventually that which we live by faith eventually becomes sight. So here... Radical faith really means moving us from being self-centered to being Christ-centered. A radical faith is a Christ-centered faith. I think that's what Paul had in mind when he said, let, let, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That the mind of Christ is better to have his mind than it is to have our minds, because our minds is distorted. It's affected by the noetic effects of sin. That our minds are good, but they're not great. That our IQ is good, but it's not as high as the IQ of God. And so the centurion understood this. He, he was caught between a rock and a hard place. There was nothing that his his Roman citizenship could do for his servant. It was nothing that 
all of the awards that he's gotten as a soldier and as a centurion could do. There was nothing that his bank account could do for the servant. There was nothing, only one who could help him was Jesus Christ. And maybe today you're at that place where there's nothing else that you can do. You're caught between a rock and a hard place and the only one that can help you out of the situation that you're in is Jesus. Just like the centurion, you've got to come to him. Just like the centurion, you have to understand the logic of radical faith. It's not based on what we know, but it's based on what God knows. This is what we must learn today in the 21st century. As Dr. King once said that we have, we have guided missiles and misguided men. Even tomorrow, we will be celebrating the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington where Dr. King talked about a dream he had had. And as I look over this audience, I can see it in some ways that the dream has become a reality because back in 1963, I guarantee you, UPC didn't have any black folks in here. <laughs> I guarantee you that there were no uh, Asian uh, brothers and sisters in the church in 1964. But because of the faithfulness of Dr. King, because of the faithfulness of the civil rights movement, uh, we can worship together in spirit and in truth because of the faithfulness of the church during that day and age. <laughs> Dr. King said on that day that as he looked over the audience, he says that as I look over this audience, I see that there are my white brothers here as well, and he says that they have come to realize that their destiny is inextricably tied to our destiny, and that we cannot reach the threshold of freedom alone. And so our destiny is inextricably tied to one another. And that's because of, that somebody was faithful they kept marching. Somebody was faithful. They kept praying. Somebody was faithful when they, they kept singing. Somebody was faithful when they kept going to the march on Washington. Somebody was faithful, and we're recipients of that today. Amen? Amen. This is what I want us to understand today, and I'm, I'm coming to a close, y'all. Jesus rewards those who are faithful. He rewards them. Look at what he says in verses 10 to 13. I don't want us to, to breeze over this. He, it says, when Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who follow him, whoa, truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith? Now, you have to, you have to, to, to catch the dramatic tone of this, of this passage because there's a, a crowd of followers around Jesus and Jesus looks around and says, whoa! I've never seen faith like this in Israel. I've never seen faith like this in Capernaum. I've never seen faith like this in Jerusalem. And this is an indictment, brothers and sisters, against the Jewish people. He's saying, here this man is a Gentile, Roman, and he has more faith than everybody who's going to church. Woo. Wow. Here, here he is, and here this man is who has more faith than everybody who prays with their faith toward, their face toward Jerusalem, praying every day, three times a day. Wow. Is this a little bit hyperbole, Ken? 
Amen, somebody. But it seems to me Jesus is highlighting the great faith of this centurion. He says, I tell you, I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the heirs of the kingdom, he's talking about the Jewish people, will be thrown into outer darkness. People who, the Jews who have rejected Jesus, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's speaking to his audience. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done according to your great faith. And the servant was healed before the before the centurion even got back to the house. He was healed in that, that hour. Look what Jesus is saying, brothers and sisters. Jesus praises the radical faith exemplified by the centurion. It is a faith that trusts that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. And here again, we see a theme running through all of these sermons that we've been preaching, that theme in the ministry of Jesus where he takes the position of being a host and not a guest. Jesus, again, practices radical hospitality and makes room for the centurion at the table. Just like he did for Zacchaeus, just like he did for the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair, he made room. Just like he did for the feeding of the 4,000 in Gentile territory, he made room for them. And here again, Jesus makes room at that future messianic banquet that we will see one day. In her thought-provoking book, Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition, Christine Pohl makes this statement. Understanding the church as God's household has significant implications to hospitality, which literally means making room. More than anywhere else, when we gather as church, our practice as hospitality should reflect God's gracious welcome. It should reflect every Sunday, every day, God's gracious welcome. God is host, she says, and we are guests of God's grace. When we come to church, the church don't belong to you. It don't belong to me. This is God's house. The pews don't belong to you. They don't belong to me. This is God's house. The piano doesn't belong to you. None of this belongs to us. This is God's stuff. Everything that we have belongs to him. We are guests. So stop acting like it's yours. <laughs> Amen, somebody. She says, she says, God is host and we are all guests of God's grace. However, in individual churches, we also have opportunities to serve as hosts and welcome others, making a place for strangers and sojourners that feel at home. You see, when Jesus becomes the host and not the guest of your life, life becomes a lot sweeter. I promise you that. When Jesus becomes the host of your marriage and not the guest, the marriage becomes a lot sweeter. 
When Jesus is the host of your career, of your occupation, life, your job becomes a lot sweeter. I promise you that. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters, as long as you are the host, there's a potential for bitterness to seep in your life. As long as you are the host, there's a potential for hatred, narcissism. As long as you're the host, there's the potential for jealousy. But when Jesus is the host, <laughs> you will have life and you will have it more abundantly. And you will be able to say what David said with conviction and sweet satisfaction. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for that great day when we will sit at the table, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The centurion would be at that table. Zacchaeus would be at that table. Those who are marginalized will be at that table because you are the host. And as we look at this table, dear God, we know that it was because of what you did on Calvary that made it possible for all of us to gather around the table and say, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Lord, we pray that you will touch somebody today who may feel marginalized, somebody who may feel like an outsider, someone who may feel lonely right now, dear God. Let them know today that there's room at the table for them. In Jesus' name we pray.